This is Into Healing, and I'm your host, Mira Adura. Today's Into Healing guest is Pam Leo, a mother, passionate literacy advocate, and the author of Connection Parenting. In this enlightening conversation, we cover everything from the significance of fostering deep connections between parents and children and the crucial need for parental support to the significance of treating children with respect and the ways we navigate triggers from our own childhoods. She also reminds us of the invaluable role of play in raising kids. I'm so grateful to be able to share such a foundational, heartwarming topic. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us for more transformational healing stories. I'm so grateful to be with you today. It really warms my heart that you you made it happen. And you made it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I made it happen. Um, where do I start? So, you know, I've always known that I've wanted to ha- I wanted to have kids. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, kids for me have always been these magical beings that show us all things good in the world. And I've always been so inspired by them. Um, and then I became a mama. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know that kids are a little bit of a mirror into our souls mm-hmm. and uh, all the things that they bring up, yes. parenting kids brings up. Um, and I realized that we have kids and have no guidebook and no tools. <laughs> and we're kind of left to fend for ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's really, I'm just so grateful for books like, for, for books like yours. Thank you. Um, because they've totally helped me on my journey. So let's dig in. Okay. <laughs> what made you realize how important connection is between parents and children? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can pinpoint it to one thing. Um, when I had my own first child, I also realized that I have no guidance here. Mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to do things differently than I had been parented, mm-hmm. but I didn't know how. And I just started, I took a course and I read one book on parenting and it just led to another and another and another and another. And I just, you know, kind of followed the breadcrumbs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, at the same time, I was a family child care provider. So I provided care from children for children ages two through 10. So I had a perfect, almost like living laboratory mm-hmm. to test out these ideas <laughs> as well as with my own children. And uh, they taught me a lot. They taught mm-hmm. me so much. And Joseph Chilton Pierce's book, Magical Child, mm-hmm. really, I think, was the part where I made the connection about connection. Mm. that this is this is what's important mm. and that the way that we are with our children has to preserve that and that we used to live in a way that connection just happened mm. and we don't live that way anymore and we can't go back to the way that people used to live but, so we have to find a way to live now that preserves connection mm. because the way we live now is really a major disruptor to connection and when we don't have connection We don't have anything except Mm. coercion, Mm -hmm. which only works until they're as big as we are. And then you better have something much stronger in place than coercion. There's a lot there. A lot. (laughs) Um, So tell me about that. Tell me how do we build a connected parent-child relationship? Well, I mean, I think it's going to be different for every family. For many families, it's observing many of the ancient ways of being with children, that when children were born at home, when they were breastfed, when they were with the family, connection just happened. It wasn't that our Mm. great, you know, grandparents knew about connection Mm -hmm. or bonding. It just happened by the way we lived. But now, all of that's very different. Most babies are born in hospital. Most babies are not breastfed. Many go into care at very early ages. And so all of those ways that we parent in our culture today create separation instead of connection. Mm, And so I thought we have to figure out, we're not going to change the way we live, but how can we live in this modern way and preserve connection and be intentional about it? Yeah. And so that's really what I focused on in connection parenting is how can we do this now? And originally, it was a six-week course that I taught, and parents were saying to me, this is too hard. 
I can't do this. Huh. And I thought, why are they saying this? And then it dawned on me because they're trying to do it alone. Oof. And parenting never used to be, was never intended to be a one or two person job. No, it wasn't. We need a community. We need a village. And so I added the seventh chapter of the seventh class on the needs of parents. How do we get what we need so that we can meet their needs? Because if we don't, we can't. And that's why people were finding it so challenging to do those things that I talk about in the book. Of this is how we build connection every day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, so how do we build, build connection every day? Yeah. How do we do that? How do we do that? Really one-on-one -on -one time with each child every day. Hmm. That is what gives them the very clear message that they matter, that they're important. And, you know, the ideal would be at least 10 minutes a day. That's just we're not looking at screens. We're, we're totally focused on being in relationship with them. Hmm. And I love a story that Stephen Covey told in his um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. He tells a story about his this man's son um, was just so into baseball. He loved baseball so much, but he wasn't very good at it. And this one summer, he took his son, and they went across country, and they visited, like, every baseball stadium mm. in the country. And when he came back that fall, he was a professor, and one of the other professors said, so what did you do this summer? And he said, I took my son, and we went to every baseball stadium. And he said, I didn't know you were that into baseball. And he said, I'm not, but I'm that into my son. Aww. And I love that story so much because that's how we do it. It's like, you know, listen and watch what they love and join them there. Oh, oh I love that. And people have asked, you know, is your, what you describe as connection parenting, is it authoritative parent, you know? They want to put a label on it. And if I had to put a label on it, I would call it relationship parenting mm. because that's really the, the bottom line of what it's about is being in relationship with our children, not in power over them. And so spending that time. So if you have five children <laughs> and you're trying to spend 10 minutes a day with each other, that's 50 minutes a day. Yeah. So maybe it'll only be five minutes. But it's making that priority that every single day you spend some one-on-one -on -one time with them, minimum you know, five minutes. Yeah. And for a lot of parents, that might be the story at bedtime. Or, you know, you find ways, you find little pockets of time that when the older children are in school, you spend it with the toddlers. You know, it's a constant juggle every day mm -hmm. to make that happen. It's not easy. But you need support to do it. So that, you know, you can take, I always say, 10 minutes a day and a date every week. And a date could be anything. It could be going to the library. It could be going out for coffee, <laughs> you know, hot cocoa, whatever, but just where you single them out. And for some children, it's going to the dump with dad. You know, it doesn't have to be Disneyland. Mm. It just needs to be that it's you and me and we're having special time together. Yeah, you definitely need a support system to make that happen. You do. You know, like yeah. I have three kids and we're outnumbered, yes. right? So <laughs> how do you... Right. You know, and, you know, not away. every, you know, the fortunate ones do have grandparents that are involved and nearby and can provide that support. But if we don't have that, we have to create family of choice. Mm. We have to find people that we can bring in and have them be part of our family of choice so that they can provide that kind of support for us and for our children. Yeah. Hmm. Um you mentioned like bedtime stories, usually bedtime stories, like for me, happen in a group. <laughs> it's all three children at once. Yes. Um, what are some tips on taking taking kind of one at a time, especially, I mean, I, I feel for my kids, it's like they want to do stuff all together. If I take one away, they want to do what I'm doing with that one, right? So it's almost kind of a family culture you have to set up mm. because just what you just said. Mm. And so just kind of introducing the idea of, you know, oh, it's a Bobby's special time. So you name it their name yeah. time is yeah. a way of yeah. doing that, yeah. you know. We, so it's, okay, it's Susie time now. Susie and I are going to, yeah. you know. We do call it special time, man. Yeah, there's definitely special yeah. time. So, yeah. you know, it's just that. Yeah. And, and it can be anything. You could cook together. You could fold laundry together, <laughs> you know. You could... You know, or they each get to pick their own story. And, you know, you have story time together, but then they each get a special one that's just theirs that they picked out or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. There's a lot of talk about mothers not being okay. 
Um, they're under so much pressure. And as a group, they often struggle with, you know, different ways of coping mm -hmm. with doing it all. You know, whether it's drinking to calm, you know, calm mm -hmm. their nervous system, different, mm -hmm. different ways of kind of coping with the pressures of working, of motherhood, of all that. Um, and it seems like parenting is this huge, important task that every mother needs to get perfect somehow. What do parents, and particularly mothers, need? Support. <laughs> Support. It needs to not all be on mom. Mm. You know, and whether it's because dad works 80 hours a week or... That's you know, not around. That they're a single whatever. mom. Yeah. I mean, there's all different ways. But it, the burden of, and it can be a burden if you're doing it all, needs to not fall on one person. Mm. And... You know, we're sold this sort of bill of goods that we should be able to be it all mm -hmm. and do it all. And that's just not even a, a realistic expectation of mm -hmm. any human. And, you know, mothers, especially like during the pandemic, I yeah. mean, so much fell yeah. on moms. It's no wonder they're all going crazy. Yeah. You know, because they, you know, inherently want to do the best at everything. How do we balance that? How do we balance getting more support, but at the same time, feeling like, I mean, I I personally feel in every inch of my being that sometimes they just want me. Yes, and it's true. <laughs> it's true. So someone else can do the laundry. Someone else can cook dinner. You know, we need people to support moms in those ways so that she is free to read that story, to mm -hmm. have tickle time, to, you know, go outside and play and is not dragged down by all of the things that someone else could be doing. Mm. You know, not that she wouldn't do some of those things, but when moms are so burdened with doing everything, it's hard to have time to make that connection. And children do sometimes, you know, sometimes they just want dad. Sometimes they just want mom. Or mm -hmm. sometimes they just want grandma, mm -hmm. you know. And so if we can find ways to support moms so that they have the space to, to, to be mom and to fill that need that children have, to just have that connection like yeah. they just want to be close and they want to be with you yeah. and and also one of the ways that we we can do that as moms too is to not feel like we have to do everything for children and it's like come make dinner with me you know come full laundry with me because it doesn't matter what you're doing as long as you're feeling connected mm. so sort of both things like you know i mean very young children aren't going to be doing that but uh you know, supporting moms in ways of relieving her, of, you know, juggling 50 things in a day and, you know, giving someone a ride to soccer practice or, you know, whatever it is to just fill in and not have mom doing it all so she has some space to just be mom. Yeah. I heard this phrase recently, connection, not perfection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not going to be perfect, man. Mm -hmm. We're going to get it wrong sometimes. <laughs> and... You know, everything we heard as a child growing up, it, we recorded, it's in there. When our buttons get pushed, that's what plays. No matter how much we want to do it a different way. And so in my book, I talk about the three R's of rewind, repair, replay. Hmm. That it's going to come out. We're going to say something we really didn't want to say. And we need to stop right there as soon as we are aware. And you can always tell when you've created a disconnect with yep. a child. 100%. Because they'll do one or all three of these things. They won't look at you. They won't talk to you. And they won't let you touch them. Mm -hmm. If they're doing any one or all three of those things, there's a disconnect. And we got to get back and to say, you know, the way I just spoke to you wasn't respectful. And I am sorry. Can we have a do-over? And do it over in a way that is respectful and loving and connected. We have to do it a lot. <laughs> but at the same time, we're modeling that so they know they can do that too. Yeah. They can learn that. You know, screens have become such a reality in modern day parenting. Um, how? What, what are your thoughts on that in relation to connected parenting? And it is a reality in our lives. And we're not gonna escape that. It's, yep. it's gonna be part of their world forevermore. Yeah. And it comes back around, I think, to we only give them something like that when we're so stretched that we we don't have what they need. Don't and so capacity. that's being the substitute for what they need. Yeah. And so more support for parents would, you know, make it so that parents didn't resort to that. And I mean, I think parents don't give it to them because I think it's a great idea. Uh, but children want it because it's what's 
there and it's easy. But one of the things I learned a long time ago about um, screens in general, that when the visual is provided, then children's brains don't need to create that image. So the same story that you read to them, if they watch it as a video, it doesn't activate their imagination. Mm. So the more time they spend with that, the less that part of their brain is developing. Oof. And I mean, the American Academy of Pediatrics has said no screens before two, I think there, it may have changed, but, but it, you see in the grocery store, people standing in line, giving their phone to their toddler, mm -hmm. practically, you know, because they're fussing, because they have needs that the parent can't meet at that moment. So they're trying to pacify them just to get through the line and mm -hmm. out the door. And that's a lot of what I think is happening. And it's because parents don't have the support that they need. It, seems, it keeps coming back to that. But also creating a family culture where you say, okay, no screens in the bedroom. Or, you know, all screens are on their chargers after, you know, whatever. Whatever yeah. works Rules. for the family. But but having some guidelines, guidelines of how we're going to use screens in our family. And, I mean, so much you hear now, and it's so true, that people don't have meals together anymore and that's a major time of connection, or everybody's at the table each with their own screen, you know? So, I mean, there's gonna be excess, you know, there just is. So it's a, a mindfulness thing of like, let's be intentional about using screens and not just having it be, you know, we wouldn't let children eat candy all day long, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So setting some boundaries and saying, this is how we're going to use screens. And I know families that don't allow their children to have a phone until a certain age. I mm -hmm. mean, people have different ways of handling it. But I think the most important thing to know about it is that when your face is in a screen, you're not connecting with anyone. There's, a, I think it was with John Bowlby, they did the still face experiment where the mom is actively talking with the baby and animated oh, yeah. and then she just does this deadpan face and the baby cries and the baby gets so upset and cries well when our face is in our phone we have a deadpan face Oof. and one mom posted i looked down at my toddler who had been busy playing so i thought i would just do this Oof. and i looked down and he's just looking at me oh and she said it was so startling wow. so mindfulness really mindfulness. yeah yeah well how can parents know they're doing a good job They'll know by their relationship with their child. And um, I saw a post once where it said, I want a parent in, in a way that if my child is in trouble, they will run to me, not away from me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very telling. Like, ah, oh, mom or dad, I really messed up. Can you help me out mm -hmm. with this? Instead of shame and hiding and like, I'm going to really be in trouble. Oof. You know, that's, that's a big indicator yeah. that, that we've built trust with them that they will come to us when, when things are hard. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I have this little thing with my kids. I always tell them, if you're scared or anxious, you just have to squeeze my hand. I love that. You know? Yeah, they sh every child should have some way of indicating that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, some children are more challenging than others. The parents often feel very alone and shoulder a lot of blame for their children's difficulties. Me. I was one of those parents. <laughs> so tell us, you know, what encouragement do you have for parents who are feeling isolated and misunderstood and what can they do? Well, fortunately, there are people who have written books about that and they were a huge help to me, mm. a huge help. I think they saved me and my youngest daughter so much wow. because I realized that I wasn't alone, that, you know, other parents have challenges as well. And, you know, it gave me some tools mm. to, you know, work with. And, but it is, it was hard. People in my family didn't understand. I knew what was going on, but they really couldn't understand. So they were reluctant to mm. help with care. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. And so I did feel very alone and very isolated. Mm. So I just, I just kept reading and reading and <laughs> reading everything I could find to try to find answers. I know that book wouldn't exist if, it, if my second daughter didn't exist. Mm. Do you mind just sharing what those challenges were? And how you dealt with them? She was very different in the world than my first daughter and, with, and different than other children I had cared for. Um, she was very sensitive. She was very emotional. 
And so I often didn't really know how to respond to her behavior. Mm. And that's what, you know, kept me looking and looking for answers and going to workshops and mm. trying to find my best ways. Because sometimes she would have, you know, just a meltdown. And when it was over, she'd be like, Mom, I don't know why I do that. Mm. I can't help it. And I knew that. I knew it was true. I knew that that wasn't her just being bad, that there was something causing that for her. And mm -hmm. so I just wanted to find answers for her and for me, yeah. mostly for me, yeah. um, so that I could, you know, be a good parent and not have those things trigger, you know, my old things. Um, but it felt like I didn't know a lot of other people who had those challenges with their child. And so I felt kind of judged. Mm. Like people thought that I was too lenient with her when I would try to work through something that was happening for her. Mm. Like why I didn't just lay down the law and say, go to your room or, you know, whatever. Yeah, um, yeah that was hard. It was hard to, to feel not understood for either of us and uh, to not have the support I needed because people didn't think I was right about how I was mm -hmm. being with her. So yeah, that was challenging. Mm -hmm. But it just made me more determined to, to find answers. And she's a magnificent woman. And people kept saying, when are you gonna write a book about this kind of parenting? And I said, I don't have all the pieces yet. I know there's more. And then I finally realized I'll never have all the pieces. Yeah, and so course. I should share the pieces I have. Of course. Which is what, what are some of the books that helped you on your path? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, definitely Magical Child by Joseph Chilton Pierce and um, Larry Cohen's book, um, Playful Parenting. I mean, I was terrible at playing with my own children, hmm. but I am awesome at playing with my grandchildren <laughs> <laughs> because I learned how. And he said, of all the parenting skills, you know, playing is something that can be learned. And I can attest to that for sure. Another one was How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. Hmm. Uh, that's a great one. Um, Bonnie Harris's book, When Your Kids Push, or yeah, When Your Kids Push Your Buttons. That was awesome. And so really it was kind of like collecting all these puzzle pieces and putting them together and coming up with a picture of, okay, this is where we need to go with this if we want to have the relationship with our children that, I mean, it's the relationship we're going to have the rest of our life. Yeah. So it's really important. It's really important not that we get it right, so to speak, but that we go forward connected and stay connected. Yeah. And, you know, there sometimes are periods of disconnection and we have to find our way back. And so you can tell when you've repaired that disconnect that we've caused <laughs> because then they will talk to you and they will make eye contact with you and they will welcome your touch. And I've added a fourth one oh. since I wrote the book. They will dance with you. Oh. Think about that. that includes all yeah. the first three. If they will dance with you. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. I love that. It's and I love dancing, so that's yeah. an easy one. <laughs> yeah. um, in an article you wrote, you said, learning to treat children with respect will require a change of heart that can come only from a major shift in consciousness of how we view children and how we define respect. What shift of consciousness is needed, and how should we define respect? Wow. I read an incredible book by Yanis Korshak, and it was called When I Am Little Again. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it caused a major shift in consciousness for me, that we need to view our children as having every right to respect that we do. And so I joke, there's an Irma Bombeck piece where... Um, they talk about saying the same things to your good friends who came to dinner as you would say to your children of like, sit up straight, your, <laughs> your back will go the way. You know, just all those things, disrespectful things that we say to children unconsciously mm. that we would never say to our peers, <laughs> our partner, <laughs> our good friend. And the same with counting. You know, it's like if your friend didn't do what you wanted them to, would you say, I'm going to count to three and you <laughs> better do this? <laughs> <laughs> right? Is that that is not respectful? So just you know, every every word we say to a child, you can ask ourselves, would I say that to my partner, to my good friend? If not, it's disrespectful, and nothing breaks connection like disrespect. Mm. And and children know, they know if we're respecting them or not. Yeah, that's been a big one in our household where our kids talk about like, oh, the, my sister did not respect me. 
So great to have that language that early on. Uh, oh, another book that was very influential for me was Nonviolent Communication mm. with Marshall Rosenberg. And he talks about power with instead of power over. And I mean, that's all about parenting. Author uh, you know, authoritarian parenting, coercive parenting is all about power over. I'm bigger and stronger and more powerful than you, and I can make you do this instead of power with. Seems like the root of everything wrong in the world right now. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Oof. Yeah. So, I mean, the pieces came from a lot of dis disciplines. They weren't all parenting books. Mm. And that for an example. Yeah. And one of the biggest pieces for me was um, Harvey Jackin's book, uh, The Human Side of Human Beings, about co-counseling, re-evaluation counseling, and how the way that we heal from the hurts that happen to us are to release those hurts through crying, trembling, laughing. There's all kinds of ways that we release that. And once we know that about children, it changes everything. Mm. You know, we don't see their, what we call misbehavior, as misbehavior. We see it as them trying to work out something that's going on for them mm. and be their safe space for them to do that. So that, that piece was huge. And so that chapter in my book, Healing the Feeling Child, that's really what it was based on. Mm. Beautiful. Um, how do we define respect? So I say, I always say giving children the same respect that we expect. And for me, respect means what you think matters, what you feel matters. You matter. Mm. And... I know, I saw this great post the other day. It's, it, was, it was a quote from Magda Gerber. And she said, a lot of bad things have been done in the name of love, hmm. but it's not possible to do bad things in the name of respect. Oof. And I was like, wow, it's powerful. Wow. And it's true. Yeah. So true. Wow. Yeah. Oof. Um, Joseph Chilton Pierce says, we must become the people we want our children to be. Mm -hmm. And you have said how we treat them is what we teach them. Mm -hmm. How do we get started on becoming the people we want our kids to be when the task seems so daunting, especially with everything else on our plates? Yeah. There's another great quote that I love. I think it's by James Baldwin when he said, children have never, children don't always do what we tell them to do, but they never fail to imitate mm -hmm. us. And to just realize that we, from day one, we are their model of what it is to be a human being. And so I always say, we'll never stop bullying until we stop bullying children. Oof. And coercive Oof. parenting is bullying. It is. And so they're learning that from us if we're doing that. And so they're going to, you know, we do it to them and then they go to school and do it to someone else. And then you tell them not to bully, bully someone else, right. and here it is happening at home. So becoming that person, you know, we don't stop growing because we have children. In fact, we start growing because mm -hmm. we have children. Totally. <laughs> and I love Scott Noel said that we will always be parenting in the gap mm -hmm. between the parenting we aspire to and that what we can do in the here and now in that moment. And that's why I think the rewind, repair, replay is so important because like Bonnie Harris says, you know, when our buttons get pushed, that's what comes out. Whatever we recorded as children, the experiences we had. And so we have to be able to just recognize that. And when children see us do that, you know, we're not saying we're perfect, we're all powerful. We're saying, wow, I just messed up. Mm. But I said, wasn't very nice. Mm. And I apologize. And let's have a do-over. Mm. And to me, that is the whole key to connection parenting. We cannot do it without that because we can't stop those words from coming out of our mouth, at least not for a while. You know, one of the... <laughs> we think a good job is so overused, right? And so in trying to change that in um, Alfie Cohn's book, Punished by Rewards, fabulous, he's amazing, um, that, you know, we just, what does that mean, good job? That means I approve of what you did, yeah. right? Yeah. And so then we raise approval seeking, right? Yeah. And so I would say to parents, they're like, if I can't say good job, I can't talk. Or if I can't say don't, I can't talk. And um, I said, well, one of the things, good is already going to be out of your mouth. And you can say, good for you, good for you, mm -hmm. you know, because then I'm not evaluating you. I'm not mm -hmm. doing that. 
And so just changing those things, you know, incremental little changes that we can make. And we think it's so great to say to them, oh, good job, great job. And I mean, we do want to, you know, have them feel, you know, that we appreciate what they've done. But whether it's for our approval, that's not so good. Yeah. You know, but so we can say things like, you worked really hard on that, didn't you? Or I see you worked really hard on that. Mm -hmm. And so Praise the effort. describe instead of evaluate, I guess, mm -hmm. is a better way to put that. To describe, yeah, describe, yeah, describe how much effort they've put. Describe, yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. then it's meaningful. Like, yeah, I did. I stayed up late doing this, or mm -hmm. yeah, I did do that. And you can feel the connection immediately. Whereas if you say "good job," it's like <laughs> it just mm -hmm. goes over, doesn't land. Yeah, yeah. I always, uh, whenever my kids ask me what I think, I say, "What do you think?" <laughs> You know, I'm like, what do you think? Like, I don't want you to feel like you need to get my approval. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you talk about course of parenting or authoritarian parenting, we often think that it involves like, you know, yelling at kids or screaming at kids or, you know, bullying kids. Mm -hmm. But also we can go into a freeze response or a flee response or shut down or completely just stop, right? Like... Instead of screaming or yelling, we could also withdraw. So talk to me a little bit more about that. That's really one of the things that's really hard on children is when parents do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's such a thing as saying to them, I'm feeling really upset right now. Mm -hmm. and I need to take a little break. I always say to people, time out is to be taken, not given. Mm -hmm. You know, but some children are going to freak out if you leave the room, <laughs> you know. And so you might have to just sit there and just kind of, you know, regroup and um but to to withdraw our attention and affection is one of the even though it may seem milder mm. it's really harsh oh, yeah because we're everything to them and for us to take that away it's yeah it's pretty severe yeah yeah mm -hmm. so momentary pause to regroup is one thing but to just you know stop talking to them or freeze them out it's very manipulative. Yeah. And it works very well because they need us so much. Yeah. They'll do anything to get back in connection. Mm. Yeah. Is connection a skill? Absolutely. Absolutely a skill. We can learn how to do that. Mm. That we can learn what it takes to create connection, like special time. And, you know, to really focus in on, you know, what makes that child tick? Mm. What, are, what do they love? And... And, and meet, like I said, meet them there. So for one child, it might be they love horses. So finding a way, you know, maybe you don't have an income that can afford riding lessons, but maybe they could get a job at a stable so they can be around horses. Mm -hmm. There's a way if we will just see what's in their heart and open that door for them in, yeah. in some way. And so I always say one of my favorite things about books is relevance. And that, so you buy them books about horses and, you know, if that, if that's what it is, or if it's baseball or if it's gardening, you know, whatever Something it is to love. find ways for them to build up that part of themselves that they're showing us they're interested in. So it, yeah. it's definitely, if we make it a priority, like I'm going to be good at connection and <laughs> just decide that I'm going to figure out ways to connect with this child. Yeah, I would call it a skill. I love that. Yeah, I love that because it just kind of gives everyone hope that they can build the skill. Yes, skill set, and everyone you know? can. That we're not like born knowing how to connect necessarily. Right, and I mean, I'm sure that there are children who, if they had parents who were really good at connecting, it will come more naturally to them. But for people who didn't have that, it doesn't mean that all is lost. Mm. It means we can learn. That's like what Larry says about learning how to play. Yeah. That's a skill that can be learned. And connection is as well. I hadn't thought of it that way before, but it really is. Yeah. What's the role of acceptance and connection with our children? I would say it's huge because, you know, we might have a vision that we're going to have a child who's in really loves sports because we did. And we might get a child who doesn't at all. Uh, and so being able to love that child for who they start showing us that they are, because I don't think they can feel connected to us if they don't feel acceptance from us mm. of who they are. 
So being prepared to like, this is the child I got, and this is the child I will nurture. Mm. I think parents have a lot of work on themselves because sometimes they have a very idealized idea of what they want that child to be like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. for sure. Parenting mm -hmm. often brings up many complicated feelings about our own childhood. <laughs> what triggers parents wanting to shut down their kids' feelings? And how can we work around triggers? Uh, well, one of the things that's hard about that is that when our children cry, it triggers all the tears we didn't get to cry. And we just want it to stop. We don't want to feel those feelings. So if we can stop them from crying, then it will push down the stuff we never got to express. How do we recognize when those kind of kick in? Well, I mean, we can sort of hear our parents' words coming out our mouth <laughs> is one of the ways. You know, we, we know those phrases. And I, a favorite phrase of mine, it's easier to um, walk a beaten path than to break trail. And as parents, we're constantly trying to break trail to not walk the beaten path of saying all the things that were said to us and to do something new. But it's harder work because yeah, it's easy just to, you know, let those words fall out of our mouth. It's what we know. It's what we know. Yeah. Yeah. It was our model of how to be a parent. There's a great exercise in the beginning of my book where I ask parents to um, make a list of everything they want for their children, all the good stuff. And then on the other side of the page, make a list of all the things they don't want to have happen. And then to go through the list and put a check mark next to everything on the good list that they did get, and also on the bad list, everything they got, and see where the most check marks are. Inevitably, the most check marks are in the side of the things they don't want to do. Oof. And so we create our list of parenting challenges, and our parent, the first things on the list will be all the things on the good list we didn't check mark. Because if we didn't have a model of that, we have to figure out how to do it. Yeah. It's a challenge. And then all the things we did check mark, if we got that, it's going to be a challenge not to repeat that. And so it really brings it up into a conscious level of what we got, <laughs> you know, what we lacked, um, what we don't want to repeat. And it won't stop us, you know, necessarily from doing that, but it will be very much in our awareness. So when those things do yeah. come out of our mouth, we'll be like, oh, yeah, that's that. And so that's one of the reasons that we often try to shut children down instead of letting them cry when they need to because it is so rattling for us because most of us were not, we didn't have safe places to mm. cry or be angry. And so, you know, we've got, I say children have a cup, you know, if, if they're at school and this happens and they don't, it doesn't feel safe to cry, so they just stuff it and, you know, they might have a cup. But the time we're an adult, we have a lake of uncried tears, Oof. of unraged rage. And so when our, especially if we do something for our child that we never would have gotten to have and they seem ungrateful or it just really <laughs> triggers our stuff. Like nobody treated me this well as I'm treating you and you don't even appreciate it. Ooh. I've heard so many parents tell me that that's hard for them. Yeah, You know, that we, because I have never met a parent who didn't want life to be better for their children than mm -hmm. it was for them. Mm -hmm. And I've also never met a parent who woke up in the morning and said, what can I do today to really mess up my kids? <laughs> you know, it's just not how it works. It's not how it works. And, you know, we start out every day wanting to be the loving parent we want to be. And, you know, our buttons get pushed and it's painful. So the best way that, that I know and the way that I talk to parents is that we need to do our own work. If we want to be that model of a human being that we want our children to emulate, then we need to do our own work, which what that amounts to really is going back to those places and releasing those tears and letting out that frustration so it's not there ready to be triggered the mm -hmm. next time there's an upset. Well, but it takes time. It, you know, it's, it takes support to have the opportunity to do that healing work. And we don't really realize we need to do it until we already have children. Yeah, and then course. it's harder to do it because we have all these other responsibilities. Of course. But it's, you know, it, it's what's required. No, I often what joke. going to take. I often joke, I wish I had done all this work before having children. <laughs> I didn't even know any of it was there. <laughs> I know so many people will say to me, oh, I wish I had read your book sooner. And I said, I wish I'd had my book. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh. Um, so how can we heal when we didn't get the childhood we deserved? The best way that I know is releasing the hurts mm. and um, the um, reevaluation counseling and co-counseling is to me as such a great answer for that because it's not expensive. It's an exchange of time that, you know, you pick a partner that's your listening partner. And I mean, I have partners that I've had for years and years where we have regular times that mm -hmm. we set aside, that we carve out to, you know, work on whatever's up. And it, it takes a long time. That the probably the most famous quote from my book is let's raise children who won't have to recover from their childhood. Mm -hmm. And you know, hopefully we can do some of that. You know, but it, it requires us doing our own healing work in order to do that. And that's the best and most practical way I have found. It's what's worked for me. But I'm still doing that work. Mm -hmm. For the last four years, I've been doing healing story circles with Rebecca Thompson Hiss. And you're never too old to heal. Mm -hmm. You really are not. Like the benefits I have gained from participating in those healing story circles has, I can't even begin to oh, describe. And I'm 73, <laughs> you know? So it, it's never too late to heal and to, to create closer. And people say, my children are teenagers now. Can I still do connection parenting? Yes, you can. You know, it's going to be different than when they're three or four mm. or babies, but it's never too late to just sit down and say, you know what? When I was raising you, there was a lot of information I didn't have and a lot of work I hadn't done. And now I realize that, and I wish I could go back and do it over, but I can't. But I want to start now mm. by acknowledging ways that I have been that we're not respectful, and can we start fresh and just start having dates, having dates? Because that's the real deal is when you spend the time. We can't just say it and you got to have a date. Yeah, it takes a lot of self-awareness and a lot of like wanting to do this work because I think a lot of times I find a lot of parents don't want to acknowledge that they maybe didn't do the best job, you know? Well, it's hard because it's hard, yeah. parenting, I mean, it's pretty critical, pretty crucial. And to, But, I mean, it isn't even that you have to acknowledge it. It's going to show up in your child's behavior. Mm. If they're struggling in so many ways, something's not going well for them. And so, you know, I mean, there can be lots of circumstances that create those things. It's not just the parenting. It's our culture. Yeah, it's course. our unsupported parenting of course. that causes so much of it. Um, and, you know, whatever experiences they have in school, I mean, there's a lot that contributes to it. But I always say, you know, whether a child grows up under your roof or not, you're responsible for that child, mm. whatever, whatever that means, you know, however you can help with that however you can support another parent because they're going to grow up and be in the world. And if you want that world to be a good place, you want to fill with people who yeah. have their needs met. Of course. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because you talk about children, you know, that are not in a good place, being challenged, but also there's the children that are very well behaved and they've just suppressed all their emotions, mm -hmm. you know, so it's just interesting. It's not always... It doesn't always show up. No, it's the, not always the, the troublemaker who's no, in trouble. right? Yeah. Because sometimes you can have like a very well-behaved child mm -hmm. that like on the surface looks like they're the best child ever. But meanwhile, they've just learned to suppress it all. Yeah. And, you know, and that comes from not feeling accepted and respected and that they had to be perfect. Mm. Yeah. Oof. All the more reason to model that we're not perfect because it gives our children permission to not be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Is parenting a way into healing? It's probably the way into healing. <laughs> <laughs> not that people who don't have children can't heal, but it's the most readily available way because it's right there every day. Yeah. The mirror is up and you're just looking straight into it. Your... Right into it. Right uh -huh. into it. Absolutely. So you've worked with a lot of different types of parents, parents in prisons, parents in rehab. Um, what, what has that work taught you? It's taught me that 
Every parent I have ever met has wanted life to be better for their children mm -hmm. than it was for them. Mm -hmm. And that no parent you know, wakes up in the morning and says, how can I mess up my child today? And that when we can give them support and information, and I mean, in those situations, especially parents really beat themselves up because, you know, they wouldn't be where I'm meeting them if things had gone well. Mm. And that they can, I think that hope is that it was a message of hope for them that when they are reunited with their children, that they can make it different, mm. that Repair. they have some tools yeah. and some information that they can use to, to make it better going forward. Oh, yeah. beautiful. And I learned so much from them. They taught me as much as I taught them. Oh. You know, by sharing, we would do the, start the class with mini biographies where they would just kind of share. And there wasn't anybody in any of those classes that didn't have hurts that made their life go in the direction that it went in. So that was a big thing that they taught me. Of course, yeah. The, the, actually, the poem that's in the back of my book, I Was Born to Love, I wrote that for Valentine's Day one year at the prison because I couldn't give them anything that they could take back to their cells except a piece of paper. So I had it printed out on red paper and just, you know, to just bring some love to that situation. Hmm. And then when I was writing the book, I thought, I'm going to include that poem at the end because it's all about how we were all born to love. Hmm. You know, but things happened. Yeah. yeah. And that we can reclaim that. Powerful. Yeah. Is the way. Um, usually we talk about parenting in a very serious and kind of quite somber way. Um, but what is the role of playing, reading, having fun in parenting? It should be the role, I think, if we were smart. <laughs> and, you know, there's always that thing, you know, work first, then you get to play. Wrong. It needs to be play first. Mm -hmm. Then you might get some work done. You know, because chil when children's cup is full. Our culture. I know. It's the complete opposite. But say you're working at home and you have children there. And I mean, if you get up and you, you know, have fun with them and chase them and do all the things that just fill their love cup, they're going to be happy to go off and play and build and draw and do those things. But if their cup is empty, they are compelled to get it filled. It's just like being hungry. Yeah. You know, so definitely that is paramount. That's why I love Larry's book so much, because he shows us, he teaches us how to do that. And I didn't know because I didn't play as a child. I was kind of, I was the oldest and the daughter. Mm. So yeah, I had a lot of responsibility very early and I didn't play. You know, I think after maybe age seven, I really didn't play that much. And so I wasn't playful with my children. But in the meantime, when I got to have grandchildren, I met Larry and read his book and did workshops with him. And I was like, ah, and I know how to do this now. And it's really a lot about being silly. Mm -hmm. And most of us have never had permission to be silly. And kids, they love silly. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, they love it. Well, and so, so the more we can do that, yeah. Oh. You shared with me that you're preparing a class called Connection Grandparenting. Yes. Can you give us a little teaser about what this course will be about? It's real. Well, I mean, it's very much like connection parenting, but grandparents, and I say that as a grandparent, we're in a unique position to do the fun stuff because the parents have the, you know, <laughs> get them to the dentist and make sure they're at soccer practice and all those things. But we get to do the fun stuff. And so... When children know they have that other layer of support in life, that's huge. That's so big. Mm. And when parents know their children have that, you know, that is so big. And so just encouraging grandparents to find their best ways of being part of their grandchildren's lives. And, I mean, there are a lot of grandparents raising their grandchildren for right. various reasons. And that's different. And you almost kind of don't get to be the grandparent when you're in that role. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you can sort of set aside, today, I'm your grandma, you know, and um, we're going to do grandma things or grandpa things. And to be that, that support system, because children being cared for by others is not something new. Children being cared for by strangers is something new. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, back in the day, you know, the 
parents had to go out in the field and do the work and the children with their grandparents because they yeah. were multi-generational families. The worst disaster that ever happened to our culture is the nuclear family yeah. because it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So even if we, you know, whether through death or moving or whatever, don't have the grandparents, aunts, and uncles biologically, we can create them. We can adopt people into our lives to fill those roles for our children. And they benefit from it oh, so yeah, much. Oh, yeah, everybody wins. Yeah. Win. yeah, you know, you, you're not only a mother or a grandmother, you're a great-grandmother now. So how has that journey been you know, the more generations, you know, the more the more you kind of become, you have another another right. generation kind of mm -hmm. um, come up. How has your evolution been? It's been really interesting, and it's in some ways been very gratifying to see the things that my children and grandchildren have perpetuated with their children that I did with them. Hmm. Um, some in good ways and some not. <laughs> um, most, mostly, I would say, in, in ways that make me happy to think like, yeah, I changed that, and now it's different for them and it's different mm. for their children. Like, I broke that pattern. And others were like, I didn't quite get that one yet. <laughs> right? So, yeah, it, it is a, a, a kind of a wondrous thing. Like I homeschooled and and my daughter's homeschooled and my granddaughter is homeschooled. Oh wow. And um so I feel like that was a pretty pretty big influence. And it was kind of a whole mindset. So um they wouldn't have continued that if it hadn't been a positive sort of thing. Hmm. So it's it is. It's I feel privileged to be able to you know, some people don't ever get to have grandchildren or let alone great grandchildren. Yeah, and so, of course. Yeah, it's it's been um, interesting and, and kind of a view of like how I was as a parent, the places that I did well and the places that I hmm. didn't do as well. Hmm. Um, I just remembered this thing that you told me that made me laugh out loud, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I'm sure you'll remember it. You said something like. I don't know if it was your um, one of your kids. You said, "Don't go treating my grandchild like I treated you." <laughs> yeah. No, something came up uh, at like a family gathering or something, and a parent said to my grandchildren uh, uh, something that was familiar to me, and I didn't say it, but that was what went through my head of like, I wish I could just say, "Don't you treat my grandchild the way I treated you." <laughs> So, yeah, because we learn and we grow and we think, oh, yeah, I know where they got that. I said that or I did that. And now it's going forward unless it gets interrupted. Oh. Yeah, I always say to people, don't think that because I wrote Connection Parenting that my children don't still have to heal from their childhood mm -hmm. because it was a journey that was unfolding as they were growing. Yeah. So I knew things when they were 17 that I didn't know when they were two. Yeah, of course. You know? And you, that can be hard. <laughs> it yeah, can be really hard. of course. Do you feel it's unavoidable to mess up your kids somehow? I think it's life that we're going to pass on things that, you know, we don't intend to. And mostly it'll be because of lack of support. Mm. Because when we get to that place where that's what comes out of our mouth, it's usually because we're so stretched, so thin, and if we had more support, you know, that might not happen as frequently or as intensely mm -hmm. because we would be able to rein it in or catch it before it comes out. So m most of the things that parents struggle with all center around lack of support for parenting. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say is one of the simplest things that parents could do with their kids? The simplest thing is to spend that five to 10 minutes every day to make that such a high priority and to give it thought, like, how will I do that today? Mm. Where will I find a window or a pocket to do something special? Mm. Like my granddaughter has been making these masks and she uses like cereal boxes and that sort of thing. And so the building I live in has a recycled dumpster. So I went out and I found cereal boxes for her and I just dropped them off. And I mean, it was a, a two minute encounter but what's the message in that? I what I do that. is important to you, and you put yourself out to support that. Mm. It, was, it was a two-minute thing. Yeah. But it showed that I cared, that I was listening, that it mattered. Yeah, that you're into what she's into. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, is there anything that you feel we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about? Well, my passion, my newest passion <laughs> is literacy. And I mean, it, it's really very connected. People are asking, how did you get from connection parenting to a book fairy pantry project? How did that happen? And it had to do with my great grandson and realizing that it is the easiest way there is to connect with a child is to share a book with them. Hmm. It, you know, because you're transported into the story. Yeah. You know, you go together to this other place, even if it's for five minutes or 10 minutes. And one of my absolute favorite books is called The Enchanted Hour by mm -hmm. Megan Cox Gurdon. I would recommend it to every parent. Mm -hmm. And she had five children, and she was a read-aloud mom. And so I call myself a read-aloud advocate. And I love to read aloud. So most of my project is focused on birth through five. But then when the pandemic came and children were home and libraries were closed, you know, we expanded it right through. And then my mom passed two years ago, and I was read to her. So our newest sort of sister project to that is called Book Angel Readers for Seniors. Mm -hmm. And it's about going into care facilities and reading to seniors. And Megan talks a lot. She has a whole chapter in her book about that, about from the cradle to the nursing home, that reading aloud to people is such a gift. Mm -hmm. And so we provide books to nursing homes, care facilities, that so they'll have books there to read so that visitors and volunteers can come in and just pick up a book. Mm. And that's what we are part of it. We, do, we don't recruit the volunteers or anything, but we provide the books. And it's, it's an exciting, exciting project. Beautiful. It seems like there's a lot of healing in that too. Absolutely. Absolutely a lot of healing. And, and that is what, what creates the, the environment for healing, mm. is to give them attention and time. Mm. Absolutely. Beautiful. It is. And it's the same with children. We're giving them our attention and our time. And the earlier we read to children, so my passion is books for babies, because the sooner we put babies in that situation of listening to stories and put parents in that situation of reading to their children, the likelihood that they will learn to read easily and joyfully is so dramatically increased. Mm. Teachers always tell me that they can tell like first day of kindergarten, what children have been read to and which children have not. Hmm. Well, and we want to make sure there aren't any who have not. So I have a part of that project is 100 stories before first grade. And I said stories instead of books because a lot of families have elders who don't read English mm -hmm. and there might not be books in their language, but they can tell stories. stories. Yeah. And so if any child who hears 100 stories before first grade is going to be 100 times more likely to read joyfully and easily. Um, Beautiful. It, reading shouldn't be a struggle because their whole quality of life and standard of living is going to depend on their ability to read. Yeah, absolutely. It feels like such a, you, just a, when we were chatting earlier, you, you, you told me about the stat that sent shivers up and down my spine. Um, can you share? Can sure. You share that? Um, so I discovered that two thirds of the 15.5 million children living in poverty in this country do not own even one book. I was just stunned. And I thought, you know, as an individual, I can't do much about poverty, but I sure can do something about getting books into children's homes. Mm -hmm. So that's been my project for the last seven years is getting books into children's homes. And so we get donated books and we give them out through food pantries because if parents can't afford food, they can't afford books. Yeah, of course. So through food pantries, the WIC program, Early Head Start, Head Start, anywhere there might be children who don't have books in their homes, we're able to get books to them. Beautiful. Yeah. That gives us, I give them a whole, whole other opportunity in life, right? Completely. Completely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the way out of poverty is yeah. literacy. Um, so my last question for you is, um, could you model for us a short, maybe five-minute repair practice that parents can do with their kids? Sure. You're going to be the kid? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. Maybe you tell me what I'm supposed to do okay. and you tell me. <laughs> so say you left wet towels on the bathroom floor again. Okay. Okay. And so I come in the bathroom and I'm like, 
you left wet towels on the bathroom floor again. How many times have I asked you not? They won't dry when they're on the floor. And I've totally checked out. You checked out like, I know. You feel terrible about yourself. You've been shamed. I've been shamed. And I'm like, oh, what I just said to you was so disrespectful. Mm. I am sorry. You did not deserve that. You did not deserve that. Can we have a do-over? So it really helped me if you will put the wet towels over the rack so that they will dry. Can we make an agreement that you're going to try to remember to do that? (gasps) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) That's beautiful. You know, but it took doing it over because my first reaction was, oh, wet towels on the floor again. You know, now I got to do, you know, now they have to go on the lawn, you know. Yeah, the whole thing. And that happens in households daily. You're overwhelmed, you're at capacity, and it's the one thing that makes you completely, like, yeah. Spill over. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, when we do that, I mean, so many messages are conveyed that I deserve to be treated with respect, mm. that, well, mom's not always perfect. She yells sometimes. She says things. But she made it right. And, you know, that's the thing, too, is that we can teach children. We're not all going to never do anything wrong. Mm. But we can make it right. Yeah. And so punishing people doesn't make it right. Mm. You know, I could have said, that's it, go to your room, no TV tonight, you know, what, what, no screen. <laughs> and what would that accomplish? Mm. You know, shame, disconnection. It was not going to get the towels picked up. Mm. You know, when, when we handle it the other way of going, whoa, I was just disrespectful to you. And then they they have that model that maybe they do something with their sibling that was like that, and then they can go, wait, I shouldn't have just grabbed that toy out of your hand. Let's have a do-over. Mm. So you find yourself saying, let's have a do-over a lot. <laughs> I think it's going to become a theme. <laughs> but that's how we heal. That's how we heal. That is to how do we it heal. Over. That's how we heal. Yeah. Awareness and then repair. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Pam. Oh, my pleasure. I appreciate you so much. My favorite much. topic. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for this time. Well, I'm grateful for this opportunity <laughs> oh. to talk about important things. I mean, you've been doing this work for so long, even before parenting became a topic that people talked about. So I'm so glad that we're able to just show everybody the power of your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. You can connect with Into Healing on TikTok and Instagram for more inspirational and behind-the-scenes content, and visit our website, intohealing.com, for transcripts and other goodies. Into Healing is made possible thanks to people like you. Contributions made through Venmo at Into Healing or through our website, intohealing.com, help us bring you more inspiring episodes. This has been Into Healing with Mira Adura. Thank you for joining us.